Welcome to part one. This is a very, very special uh, show. It's going to be in three parts. This is part one. I'm going to be talking to Martin Jones, who's basically an unsung hero in uh, in UK hip hop. I mean, he was there from the early doors in the West Midlands scene, documenting, you know, some absolutely incredible photographs so we're going to be talking about the early you know the early 80s west midlands hip-hop and graffiti scene please share this around the socials because there's some really important history being dropped here this is part one peace right lights camera action on this week's show we have in my eyes an unsung hero and who, who was basically a youth worker in the inner city adventure playgrounds in the 70s and the early 80s who played a very important part in the west midlands early hip-hop and graffiti scene and played a pivotal role in graffiti artist goldie's early career goldie's manager and agent from 1984 to 1990 we have from london all the way over to the west midlands the one and the only martin jones in the place all right <laughs> great great to have you on board martin yeah nice to do it i've uh, i've seen some of your stuff it's great so uh, looking forward to it yeah listen this for anyone watching this this is going to be an absolute incredible interview and it's a real honor to have martin you know come forward to do this and a big shout out to woody for kind of sorting this out as well and what we're going to be doing martin is going to be unleashing some of his basically his early photographs i mean you know basically martin was like the uh jamel shabazz or the joe conzo of the uk you know i know martin doesn't want to get big-headed but i'm going to big him up you know martin's photographs of the early 80s hip-hop scene and graffiti scene in the west midlands and also at some of the early london jams are absolutely incredible yeah um I took up photography, uh, well, maybe 10 years, well, a good 10 years before I got into hip hop. So I, I was well into documenting what I was doing. And uh, it just sort of came naturally as and when we, we did stuff, I, I would record it. So, right, Martin, let's, uh, let's rock and roll. First two questions right. I, I always uh, start off with is whereabouts are you from and what was it like growing up, you know, as a kid? Yeah. Um, um, as you see, I'm sort of ready for you here. Uh, this is um, a photo of uh, my mum and dad, uh, taken during the war, basically. And uh, he was a um, he was he was a lawyer and a politician. Before that, he was a major in the British Army. Um, when he left the army, yeah, he uh, stood for Parliament. And uh, he was MP for Hitchin from 1945 to 1950 uh, for the Labour Party. He knew all the, the big guys, Harold Wilson, George Brown, James Callaghan. And he was um, one of the guys who set up the, the welfare state. This is well before I was born, particularly wow. the, the National Health Service. So he, you know, he was a fantastic example for me. And sort of when I came into the world, uh, he'd gone back into being a lawyer and uh, he was in practice in Stevenage. Your dad was obviously a big inspiration to you. Yeah, I, I sort of really admire him and, and my mum, obviously, um, for, for the background and upbringing that, that they, they gave me. And uh, on, the, on the legal side, he uh, wrote the, the prime uh, text for solicitors and, and barristers um so you know when you, if you're studying to become a solicitor or a barrister his book is still the the uh, uh the book to go to wow In incredible um, yeah. never, never knew that wow yeah you know what music was you listening to back then what was uh what was basically on your turntable you know or on your cassette tape as a kid i'm very glad you asked that one <laughs> <laughs> let's take it back it's got me turning the house upside down. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I kept uh, virtually all the records. So, I mean, without boring you too much, 1950s, um, Smoke Gets In Your Eyes by The Platters. Mm. Um, can you see these? Yeah, the original 45s. 45s, yeah, 7 inches. 
Uh, then we've got Wheels by the String Alongs. Then Cliff, 1960, Bachelor Boy. Yeah. There you go. And uh, then The Shadows, of course. Uh, that one's same sort of time, about 1960. Then we get to the big ones, 1963, I Want to Hold Your Hand, The Beatles. Yeah, um, I, I and then it. later on in my childhood, we got The Monkees, and they had a TV show. Um, and this one's called uh, Daydream Believer, by, by this probably the best known one, Daydream Believer, by, by The Monkees, 1967. Yeah, massive, so, massive, massive classic. Yeah, and then sort of coming out of my childhood until um, as an early adult, it was, um, you know, prog rock and folk rock. So we've got um, Fairport Convention. Uh, we've got Led Zeppelin, Jimmy Page, uh, Led Zeppelin. Yeah. Le Legends. And then my all-time favourite, Pink Floyd. Pink Floyd, yeah. Dark Side of the Moon, classic. But I've got all all of their albums. So, so you, had, they, you had a very you had a very very good taste in music, you know, growing up. Yeah, um, I think I did. Yeah, I, I spent a lot of money. Um, you know, used to buy so sort of two or three albums a week. Mm. Uh, you know, in, in the early seventies, you know, just. Because they were so attractive, you know, they they made them visually very appealing, and they were all f full of information about the groups and uh, very well laid out. So they were very attractive, and I spent a fortune on them. In the seventies and the early eighties, uh, you know, you was a you was a youth worker, and you was like heavily involved with like the adventure playgrounds. You know, can you yeah. tell me? You know, can you tell me about that? I mean, the importance of the adventure playground and the youth centres back then were absolutely pivotal and you know because it gave us kids you know it gave we was free you know we was like free as a bird we was like playing around there was no, none of this pc stuff going on you know it was just incredible brilliant times yeah um well i <laughs> i've got a bit of a background i trained as a, a teacher initially and i decided it, it really wasn't for me i uh I've done some youth work on adventure playgrounds in 1972, 1973, Woodgate Valley and frankly in, in Birmingham. And uh, I sort of messed about a bit after I'd left the college and did a light removals business. And then I had a gardening business. And then I saw an advert for adventure playground in uh, Foundry Lane in, in Smethwick uh, called Black Patch. And uh, it has a hell of a history it was used as a dumping ground by Samwell uh, at the time. And, um, you know, families just got got left there and had to survive the best they could. But historically, amazing. It was where the Industrial Revolution began with Bolton and Watt. They built the steam engines there. Is, and, that, is, uh, that, is that why uh, the, the term the black country, is that where the term come from? Because there was a lot of... Um... A lot of coal burning and 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 it was you know really kind of is that yeah. where the term come from yes it is yeah somebody i think wrote in the times that they visited the area and uh, all they could see out of their window was you know smoke and and furnaces so it's coal it's iron foundries that kind of thing mm. so um it created a lot of grime which is still still on a lot of the buildings um, it must have been a hard, it must have been a really hard, you know, black, the, the black country, yeah. must have been a really so, kind uh, of hot, like, must have been a really kind of hard environment to basically work and to bring your family up. I mean, you know, it must have been really tough. Yeah, um, th these were streets that had been left behind, if you like. The Industrial Revolution had since moved on. And uh, th these these were families sort of growing up in in... I suppose you would call it semi-squalor, uh, but they made a hell of a, uh, a fight of it. And, you know, I was privileged to work with them and, and their children at, uh, at this place called Black Patch. And this guy called um, Ian, Doc, Dr. Funk, he became. Oh, wow, is that that's Dr. Funk? Oh, brilliant. Yeah. So this is a 10-year-old Dr. Funk, and that is a, a me from 1978, so I was about 24 at that point. And uh, first thing I did on the playground was um, get a 
uh, salvage contractor to dump a lot of, of wood on, on the playground, bought a load of hammer and nails and saws, and we started building dens. And that, that was a, a bunch of playground life in, in those days. We had a grotty old football changing room, which we had the use of during the week. And um, I got my dad to buy a table tennis table and a pool table. And uh, that's the way we spent our evenings, really. Um, we had a, later on, we got a, a floodlights put in into the park and they built a five-a-side area. And we ran a five-a-side league between the various playgrounds in the area. And as I say, Martin, you know, there was no health and safety back then. You know, that was in the days where, because I used to play in, in New Cross, there was a, an adventure playground there called Somerville Adventure. And basically, you know, you go on the rope swings and it was like, you know, like um, there was about like 80 feet up high and you'd like all pile on the rope swing, like about six of you and just yes. like go from one side to the other. It was brilliant. Well, we had the counterpart to that uh, in Hockley in Birmingham. Again, you know, a, a, a very deprived area. Um, and it was where the, the old canal and the railway uh, came together. And, um, you know, you can still see the stables there, which were used for the canal horses. And uh, it became, you know, the home for uh, houseboat uh, owners. So some of these guys here were the owners of, of boats. And uh, together we sort of created this community group. Um, I was employed by the Sports Council as a sports worker because I was heavily into organising sport at that point. Um, and then from time to time we'd have celebrations like this, we'd have parades and uh, everybody was up for it. But I, I, I know what you mean about the aerial runways and things. Um, Some time before I joined, they built a huge adventure playground and that had the aerial runways on it. And, uh, you know, you did have the occasional accident, but it was not something you moaned about. Yeah, you just you just <laughs> cracked on and got on with it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I, I miss them times. Um, you know, we were just we were just so free. I mean, it, it was it was brilliant. And there, there was no, you know, back then there was no like, you know, there was no internet, so you wasn't glued to your phone. And you know, you was just, you know, you'd go out and you wouldn't come back till like, like depending on your age, but seven or eight at night when you was kind of ten or whatever. Do you know what I mean? That, that's right. Yeah, I, I mean, it was a safe environment. Uh, that, that we created. I mean, you had the canal boat owners obviously giving security overnight, and some of those were, were youth workers. Um, but families used to allow their children out, and they would stay, you know, from the time they came back from school until uh, until it got dark. Yeah, you kind of got Im immersed in the, the sort of playground culture, and you know, I knew all the, the children by name. You, you got this is this is why it was different and appealed to me i think because unlike at school you know you're dealing with children yes you do get to know them to a certain extent you don't get to know the full story really which you do you get to know the children and the families on the, the adventure playground setup and, and sadly none, none of that really has uh, managed to um survive into you know the 2020s it's a real, it's, 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 it's a real shame. And to be honest, you know, grow, growing up as a kid, we kind of looked up to, you know, adults like yourself, the youth workers, the, the ones that worked in the adventure playgrounds. We looked up to you. You was kind of, you could say, a little bit like a father figure. Yeah, father or sort of older brother, uh, that that sort of thing. And hmm. um, I've just sort of introduced that shop, for example. Now. That's me with the first uh, playground side that we had uh, back in 1981-2. And uh, we were in the Birmingham Boys League, which is a, a really good league. And the first match we had, uh, it was a friendly on, during the summer holidays. And they got beaten 36-0. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, what I didn't realise at the time was that Bustleome, who beat us 36-0, <laughs> they were a feeder team for Aston Villa Football Club. Uh, and I did, also didn't realise that they took it so seriously. Uh, it wasn't like youth work as such. This, you know, they were dead serious. They were going to be professionals. So we got done over by, you know, Aston Villa junior, junior team sort of thing. 
36 <laughs> nil, that's hilarious. But it did, you know, it didn't deter them. They just loved it. Came came back every week. The one error you spotted, I, I, they didn't have any kit, so I thought, well, I'll just go and buy a, buy some kit for them. You got the Argentina, the, the Argentina. Yeah. Kit. Oh, all right. So it was all right until we declared war on the Falklands and the, you know, the bombs started dropping and. Uh, then it wasn't really the, the desirable kit to have when you were sort of out, uh, you know, playing the best teams in the league. You've got a lot of stick from the, the sidelines. So we ch- I think we gave them some Ver- Villa kit later on. It was uh, me in about 1982. And the, the van is actually pretty important because without that, I wouldn't have been able to do all the work with the, the football teams. And later on with, with, with hip hop. Can you, um, you know, can you kind of tell me about you know, the early years of the West Midlands hip hop and graffiti scene? I mean, can you basically tell me how it kind of, you know, how, how everybody got into it? You know, from your eyes, how did you see it? Yeah, I can only do it from my eyes, really. But there, mm. there, there's more of a history than I was aware of. And I think the scene really developed at the, the big um, soul and funk uh, all day as in, in the early 80s which um, were a continuation of the, the Northern Soul uh, gatherings. And um, uh, so, you know, the music would have been introduced to uh, our local kids when they went to um, the, the Aldeas. But from my point of view, I first became aware of hip hop with Malcolm McLaren and Buffalo Gals. And I looked it up and it came out about December, 1982. And it was still in the charts in February uh, 1983. And then I clearly remember uh, the guy who went on to become DJ IMD uh, coming onto the playground. He'd been given tapes from uh, Kiss FM in New York, uh, where his cousins lived, been sent these tapes, and he used to play them on uh, a beatbox. And kids used to come and uh, jam to, to the music. And um, so that that's really the how it uh, first began, how I first became aware of it. Then about June, it was getting so popular, I thought, great youth activity, let, let's have a competition. So um, I organised a competition for uh, any, anybody from the whole area, you know, to come. And uh, in those days, it was popping, body popping, unlocking and that kind of thing. And double dutch. Uh, which the girl, girls were into a lot, which which doesn't um, which doesn't really get talked about. But yeah, the double double Dutch was. Uh, if anyone watching this, watch double Dutch on YouTube. It's basically with two skipping ropes, and yeah. uh, one of the, one of the girls, or even two or three girls in the middle, skipping to two skipping ropes. Yeah, that that's right. And the athleticism and the timing and the synchronization mm. that the girls used with double dutch was incredible and it was just as big on the playground as uh, as as body popping really and um i i what i haven't got at the moment i've got some tape of that that, that first dance contest and it would be good good to actually uh, get you know transfer it to digital so we, you know we could see where it first began but the upshot of it was uh that the, the best guys decided well you know, we want to have a crew because there was a crew already in Birmingham, I think, at that point. There's one in Smethwick. Um, and they wanted to battle them. And so they wanted their own crew. And I started off uh, rehearsals at Hockley Port in one of the, the big warehouses there. Um, but it just became so popular that uh, I got connections down at Midlands Arts Centre in Birmingham in Cavern Hill Park and uh, they offered us the use of a dance studio if we come and that's for free if we did workshops because um, the media hype was building at this point so a lot of people wanted to come and uh, they saw a market for getting younger people from all over the city to uh, to come to Midlands Art Centre up until then it was quite exclusively middle class and we changed all of that on, on Sunday afternoons We'd have anything between 100 and 130 kids at these sessions. I don't know if I've 
Yeah, here we go. This, th these are the Ace Squad and the Wicked Sisters. Um, and they led the sessions for us. So, so well, were, the, uh, were, were the Ace Squad, were they kind of one of the main kind of crews from that area? Uh, yeah, um, Hockley Port and Hockley Flyover was, was where they mainly came from. There, there were people from other areas. Um, Mr. Flex was a DJ and uh, he didn't dance so much, but he, he provided the music. He was a collector along with uh, Deverell here, DJ IMD. Uh, they both went to Summit Records to get the latest imports from New York on their 12 inch singles. Where, uh, where, was, where, where was Sonic Records? Su Summit, Summit. Uh, oh, Summit, was, uh, sorry, Summit, yeah. Where was Summit Records? It was just off New Street in Birmingham. Yeah, Temple was that, Street. I was, think it was. Was, was that kind of the main shop where people would go and get their vinyl? Yes. There was an equivalent one in Wolverhampton as well, I think. Ruby Reds. Mm. Um, somebody will correct me on that one, but I think it was Ruby Reds in Wolverhampton. Every, every city had their sort of uh, go-to place for uh, for the imports. Yeah, I mean, then, as you as you know, in London, we had Groove Records and there was a few other places as well. So we was quite lucky. Yeah. Yeah. But so each of these had a specialism. He was a jazz dancer. Uh, he was a he was a jazz dancer and a, and a rapper. Um, they were Caribbean dancers, but they perform with the Ace Squad. So it was a nice little mix. You know, you had synchronized mm. Caribbean dancing, and then you got the heavy, heavy breaking later on into their careers. Um, and I so love, yeah, I love, I love, I love the uh, the early fashion as well. You know, you got the the, the the baseball cap with the kind of the velvet kind of uh, logo stick, like printed on the front. The, got yeah. wearing the Adidas. You can tell that's kind of like that eighty three kind of style. Yeah, Oasis uh, was the place they went to, which was in uh, Colmore Row in Birmingham and it was a huge sort of market and there there was um, like a supplier of the sweatshirts and mm. the uh, tracksuit bottoms and the hats and they used to print them with your street name so he was he was Captain Richard Heaven his name but his name was uh, Captain Fizzy and they all had street names don't ask me what they were <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Think he was he was BA Extro um, he was Magoo well, I know that from that uh, and he was called Fire, because his dancing was on fire. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. But, you know, Martin, I love I loved talking about, you know, early crews. I mean, you had, like, incredible crews like Street Machine. You had um, the Rock City crew from Nottingham, Broken Glass from Manchester. I mean, in London, you had, like, yeah. side, you had Sidewalk, South London Breakers, the Micron crew, Aussies crew, the Jedis. I mean, you know, back in them, that kind of 83, 84 era, the, the crews were slowly developing and becoming really powerful. Yeah, um, the, the first time I really became uh, aware of the, the battling and the rivalry between the crews was uh, an event which I organised at Midlands Art Centre again, but it was in an open air arena, um, which it was like a Roman style gladiatorial arena. So it was perfect for open air stuff. And um, I don't know how I got in touch with the B-Boys and with Future Shop, but B-Boys came from Wolverhampton Future Shock came from Coventry. And I ended up sort of managing and being agent for both of them. But for the, the event, I set up a battle between the two. First of all, um, Future Shock took on Rock Six. They were a Birmingham crew. And then the big battle was between the Wolverhampton B-Boys and there were about 12 of them against Future Shock. And Future Shock were knackered because they'd already battled Rock Six. But you'll see on my YouTube channel uh, that there's footage of, of that first incredible battle between Future Shock and, and Rock Six. Yeah, what well, we do, uh, Mike, we put, we put the link to that battle. I'm going to put the link below in the description thing. So anyone watching this, after this interview, click on that link. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you, you mentioned some of the other crews. The following year, I didn't have anything to do with uh, the, the event, but uh, they did a reprise of it and uh, they got Broken Glass uh, to battle the Supreme Rockers. And, you know, if anything symbolized or epitomized the battling and the, the moves and the incredible 
physical ability of the, the breakers at that point. It was it was that particular. I mean, the the eighty four battle was great, uh, and this was just a development of it, really. And, and Supreme Rockers, they were from Birmingham, weren't they? Yeah, they were amazing crew. They were managed by Frenchy, who was he's the manager of uh, Summit Records, where where they got all the twelve inches from, and uh, so he, he he kind of got them together, and they sort of congregated around around the record shop and. He got them the gigs and uh, he got them rehearsing and that sort of thing. But there were some uh, amazing characters in there. So let's talk. Let's should we talk about some of the uh, like the early kind of like the early jams and all dayers? You know, this is fairly typical. You, they would hire a nightclub, and then kids from all over the country would get on buses, which were sort of entrepreneurial jobs by you know local kids who would you know hire a coach and they'd sell tickets. So is that um, where is that where is that where your 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 van at the beginning is this where this also comes into it because you was taking the b boys and the b girls to these kind of like these jams? Uh, th it was more useful for the commercial stuff, which I got later, really. But uh, you know, yeah, occasionally I would give um, b boys or Future Shock uh, a lift to um, you know uh, one of the events that was was happening at the time. The, the crews who would turn up at uh, all dayers who would be looking for battles. And it's there really that the breaking developed. You, you developed your technique in battle against against other crews. And that, that was the key part for them. And Martin, did you, uh, a question I've got for you as well, because uh, we're talking about the breaking and all that now, but let's talk uh, very quickly about the graffiti. Was there any kind of early graffiti going on from, you know, your neck of the woods? Right, I hope you enjoyed that. Absolutely brilliant start in part one. Absolutely amazing photos. And you wait till you see part two and part three because we're going to be going into a lot more detail on the early graffiti scene in the West Midlands. We're going to be talking, you know, talking about obviously Goldie's history, the b-boying history from the West Midlands scene. And we're going to go into a lot more detail with some incredible photographs. So definitely check out part two and part three. And whatever you do, please share this around the socials because, you know, there's some serious UK hip hop being dropped here so please share this interview and also comment and like peace